Good evening, everyone, and good morning to Martin and Grant for joining us. They're our guests today. And welcome to an online ITA event. And today we have Martha Burnett and Grant Barrett, and they produce and host a show called Away with Words, a show about language and how we use it. And today they're joining us to tell us about the show. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Boker Tov. We're glad to be here. Um, Artie, did you want to start with some questions or shall we just uh, start talking? Okay, just start talking and take questions as you like. You know, <laughs> sure, you know how to manage questions. <laughs> um, all right, great. Martha, do you want to lead? Um, well, as, as you already said, we do a show about words and how we use them. And so that's all aspects of language. It's word origins, it's slang, it's grammar, it's, uh, it's sometimes disputes uh, between couples about usage. Oh, I have a cat walking on my keyboard. <laughs> there should be a word for that. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, we take... They usually write those words for me. They usually, <laughs> I hope you pay them well. It's not readable by humans though. <laughs> Secret cat language. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, our show has been around for, um, gosh, Grant, what, 16 years? I've been doing it 16 years. Well, the show with other hosts started in 1998. So uh, we've been doing, Martha and I have been the co co-host of the show since 2006. So we've, we've been the longest running pair of hosts and we took over the show as the people, two of the three people who run it in 2007. So now the show is, uh, we're the principal people who run it. So we're not just the faces of the show. We are two of the key people behind the scenes who manage the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a call-in show where people call with their questions about language or their disputes about language, um, or uh, as I said, word origins or regional dialects. We do a lot of work with uh, regional dialects, particularly in the United States, but not exclusively. Uh, and uh, we're on national public radio stations across the country in the U.S. and available by podcast as well. Yeah, we, um, so when we took over the show in 2007, we were on 12 stations in four American states, and now we're on something like 330 stations in 40 states. So we've grown the show quite a bit, and our podcast listenership has grown just about kind of the same proportion. So it's been really good for us, but we're still a really tiny company. We have four full-time people that do this national show. Um, and a, a one part-time person and, uh, and a couple of volunteers now and, and, and again. So it's one of those things where in the United States, people who listen to our show think, wow, you must be this giant company with all these people. But we're, we're, you know, we're just a couple of goofballs who uh, these days are, are recording at home, you know? Um, so uh, with the, with the COVID-19 and the pandemic, we've started producing our show at home with four different people in four different places. And then, connecting our callers over the internet, and it's working out, fortunately. We're still able to produce new episodes of the show. And we, um, like Martha said, we do talk to people around the world. We've had people in uh, every continent except Antarctica, I think. Oh, did we do somebody in North Africa? I don't know. We, got, we get South Africans on all the time, but they're not usually from in South Africa at the time. But um, anyway, so yeah, it's, it's, it's real rewarding. Um, the caller dispute the calls disputes between couples are really one of my favorite things my my favorite call of all time that was about couples was this american couple where they were truck drivers they drove long haul trucks across the country together in a cab you know making deliveries of merchandise and goods and he is a texan with a thick texas accent but she is a Puerto Rican American from the Bronx in New York City. And so she speaks a variety of English that is incredibly different from him. They, they're two Englishes, very different, but they're both native English speakers. But the two varieties of English are so 
astonishingly different that they would spend most of their time, it seemed like the way they described it, good naturedly bickering about who was right. And so they called us just kind of settle one of their longstanding debates. And it was so utterly charming because you could hear that um, the bickering wasn't real fighting. It was kind of um, love taps, so to speak, you know, like where you, it's just because you know somebody so well that you can argue with them so well. Does that make sense? <laughs> Uh, you, you love so much that you can argue so much. It's kind of, it was kind of interesting anyway, but it touched on all of our themes, which is regional differences. There's not one English. There's never been one English. A lot of the conflicts that we have about language are because we encounter people who don't speak like us. A lot of the biases that we have about languages where we judge other people are because we haven't sought to understand them. We haven't, we haven't tried to find out anything about their language. We assume that we're right and they're wrong, but this couple wasn't doing that. They were asking each other, oh yeah, why do you say that? What's the reason that you're different from me? And that's the important step that Martha and I on the show try to teach our listeners, not to judge, but to ask, why is this different? And, and, and what can I learn about this? Well said. Oh, anyway, yeah. I'm sorry. I can run off at the mouth, so. <laughs> That's why we do what we do. That's why we do what we do. Yeah. Um, so, we, um, so we took over the show in 2007. We run it with our producer, Stephanie Levine. She's like the tiny dynamo that runs the show. She's fantastic. Um, so sh uh, what we do is we present the call. The show sounds like a call-in show, but it's a call-out show where because the show airs at a lot of times around the country, we can't actually do it live live. It's not truly live. So what happens is when you call our toll-free phone number, you leave a message for us. And we go through all those voicemail messages and all of our email and all of our social media. And we pick the interesting ones. And then our producer, Stephanie Levine, gets back to these people and says, look, we really like what you had to say. We'd like to get you in on a recording. And then what we do is we line them up on the day of the recording and we record them one after the other as if, the, as if it's live. And then we trim the calls so that we remove any mistakes from the callers or from us. And we make sure it's exactly the right length and then we push it out like a live show. And so in that way, the show sounds live, but with any station can air it at any time whenever they want. So a station in Vermont airs it at 6 a.m. on a... Sunday, I think, and then a station in Texas airs it uh, at 10 a.m. on a Saturday, and somebody else airs it on a Thursday, and so anybody can put it on the air whenever they want. And, and in that way, we can, the important part of that is we make sure that because it's not live, we can sample all the different areas of the country and get people from parts of the country that we don't hear from very often, like parts of Alaska where we can speak to the native people of Alaska and hear their stories, or people who still speak French in parts of Maine, which is kind of a surprise to a lot of Americans, um, that there are any French, native French speakers in parts of Maine, or you know, people, of, uh, people who aren't mainstream English speakers uh, who are here in this country learning English and have some questions, people who might have really, it took them a, a lot of guts, a lot of courage just to call us and say, look, I don't understand and my English isn't very good. Can you help us? And so we make sure that we sample all those kinds of people and get them on the air. And it's, it's, it's rewarding, I think. Don't you think, Mark, Martha? Oh, it's completely rewarding. We love connecting with listeners. And that's one of the things that we've missed, of course, in the, in the last few weeks. Uh, we did a nine city tour last year of New York and uh, Portland, Oregon, and, and uh, through the Midwest and Washington, DC. And, and every time we, um, we do an event where we, where we invite people to come see us, we get hundreds and hundreds of people who show up because everybody wants to talk about language. I mean, I'm sure that you all find that when people find out what you do for a living. Everybody yeah. <laughs> uh, has opinions <laughs> and, um, and, um, yeah, so pe and people are just endlessly curious. It, it always turns out when, when Grant and I do presentations that, that, we, that sometimes the Q&A, the question and answer, 
is the very best part of the whole thing. There's, there's this one moment where, you, where we say, now we're gonna take questions, and there's a moment of hesitation, and then one person raises their hand, and then, and then the, the floodgates are open, and we spend more time on that than anything else, because people are endlessly curious about language. And so we bring, each of us brings a different kind of expertise to the show. For my part, I came up as a uh, kind of a hanger on in the world of sociolinguistics and dialect studies. I became involved with a group called the American Dialect Society. And then after that, I became a dictionary editor specializing in slang and new words. And then when they were casting around looking for somebody to fill in for one of the previous hosts of this show, I filled in for him a couple of times. And then when he left the show, they auditioned me again and then hired me to fill in for him, or for, to, for, to replace him. And so then when the show, when we took over the show, then I became a permanent member of the cast, uh, a permanent host. Um, and so I bring to this uh, background from the middle of the country in Missouri. My father's kind of had a southernish aspect to him. My my mother was very kind of suburbanite. Um, I I have a you know I'm I'm a little younger than Martha, so I bring a little bit of that. And then Martha's background is is interesting as well, but different than mine. So we bring different pieces. Yeah, we find that that most of the people in the language trade, or at least as as uh, in the the format that uh, we work, everybody's got a really different story, and mine is really different from Grant's. Um, I was fascinated since childhood with antiquity, and in fact, um, years ago, I spent a summer uh, working as a volunteer up at Tel Dan uh, with the Hebrew Union College, uh, working at the excavation up there. It was long ago enough that uh, I have photos someplace of Moshe Diane coming to <laughs> inspect the site. So that's, that's how long ago it was. But um, I had a, had a summer there at Tel Dan and remember walking down the road into Kiryat Shmona to get Glida and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I bounced around uh, for years just kind of dabbling in antiquity. And then I was in college and I was, I had had a lot of Latin uh, as, as a young person, but I was in college and I was really struggling with my introductory Greek class. Um, and I, w I was basically flunking out of ancient Greek. And I found the short story, uh, short version of that is that I found a tutor who was an elderly man from Latvia who spoke many, many languages, and he agreed to tutor me in ancient Greek on Monday nights. And so I started going to see him, and, and every night he would tutor somebody in a different language. I think it, Tuesday it was Italian, Wednesday it was Russian, uh, Thursdays he, taught, he also taught Hebrew, uh, Fridays, I don't know what he did, but, but he, he was just this, this retired professor of classics who was a lifelong ed educator. And, um, and he started to show me how language fit together in a way that I never had seen before, taking the roots of, of ancient Greek. I was trying to, um, to learn ancient Greek through uh, vocabulary drills and exercises, and he threw that book across the table and said, we will read this, and he hands me a copy of Oedipus Rex, the great tragedy by Sophocles in the original Greek. And I thought, this is nuts. I, how can I even do this when I'm still struggling with the alphabet? But he showed me how, for example, <clears throat> the name Oedipus means swollen foot in ancient Greek. You may remember that the, uh, that the story goes that Oedipus, uh, when he was a child, uh, was left out in the wilderness and his feet were injured and ever after he was known as swollen foot and my professor said said you have in English do you not the word edema and I said yes it means swelling and he said exactly it's related to Oedipus uh, the swollen foot and then and then he talked about the pus in Oedipus being related to Latin po, Latin um, pes pedis meaning foot like in pedestrian and pedestal and uh, podos in ancient Greek, 
uh, tripod and those kinds of words. And it opened up this world of language that I had never imagined existed, all these connections between and among words. And I was just, I was, I was hooked. And so I spent years uh, as a journalist, uh, but always felt like I had um, unfinished business with uh, ancient Greek and Latin. And so I, I went on and did graduate work in ancient Greek. Um, but I always wanted to find a way to, to make that kind of information accessible uh, to the general public. And so eventually I found myself uh, finding the radio show, found my way to the radio show. So I, I, I think, Grant, that that's true of pretty much all of us. Uh, in this business that we all come to it from such different, uh, different. Yeah. Practices. Yeah. And, and, and there's no and, one way to do it. No. And I, I, and the dictionary editing business was the same. Uh, very few people take a, you know, coursework for dictionary editing and follow some kind of regular path to get a degree and go into dictionary editing. People come from uh, computer programming and, and publishing in other corners. And some of them just, fall into it because they know a friend and just need a job and they just happen to have a knack for it. It's just very strange. For, for me, my, my background was information technology. I did computer tech support and um, just had this sideline in being interested in language. And when I was in college many years ago, I just wanted to be a better writer. And I got on the email list of the American Dialect Society and just kind of hung around. And after a while, they were looking for volunteers to help with the website. So I said, sure, I'll help with that. And then I started going to the conferences and reading the journals. And before you know it, I'd picked up some knowledge. And, and then when that first dictionary job came around, it turned out that they thought I had enough knowledge to be a dictionary editor. And so they hired me and it worked out. Um, and I did that for a number of years. And so um, it's, and I was, a, I was a former journalist as well and used to work in print and digital news and I did some radio back in the past and other things. So it's, it's very strange to, tell people, you know, yeah, I used to do IT for, for a number of years, and um, people say, but how do you go from that? And I don't know, I, for me, information technology and journalism and dictionary editing and what Martha and I do now are the same. You take a complex topic and you explain it so that anyone can understand. They're all the same. They're all taking, they're unraveling and, and, and breaking apart these, uh, these, teasing it apart and then reordering it and presenting it to people and say, here, this is, this is what you really need to know. I think it's all the same. The journalism is like that and uh, explaining technical problems is like that and, and, and dictionary editing is like that and writing a, writing a concise dictionary definition so that anyone can understand a complex idea and, and what Martha and I do, absolutely. So um, I see we've got some more people coming and that's great. Okay, what else? Um, you know, Uri, I've got some, um, I do have a favorite call to share if you would allow me to do a little screen sharing. Sure, go ahead. All right, let me see if I can get this to work. This is a sweet little girl um, that we, we recorded a couple years ago. Her name is Aya. Let me see if I can get this to work. Oh, it says it's disabled. Disabled? Yeah. Mm, am I, okay, am I supposed, I don't see anything that's, that's Let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe try now. All right, let me try. It. All right, let me see here. All right. All right, can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. Is it full screen? No, it's not full screen, but. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that yeah. was full screen, yeah. Well, will this pass audio, do you know? I have no idea. I haven't tried this. We're gonna we're gonna find out. Can you hear that? No, sorry. Okay, never mind then. I thought it would pass the audio through. I'll have to figure out another solution that another time. Anyway, I'll unshare my screen. How do I do that? Any, anybody know? Stop uh, share. Stop. Stop share. I don't stop. see it. Oh, I see. Uh, they made it. They, they reduced all my windows. It's up at the top. It should be. Show meeting controls. That's what I need. There we go. <clears throat> Thank you. 
All right, sorry about that. I thought the audio would pass through. Okay. So we get a lot of, go ahead. Maybe you could just tell us about the cold. If, uh... um, Martha, why don't you go ahead and talk and I'll figure out a way to make the audio pass through. Okay. Well, this was a little girl named Aya who called about the term high and dry because there had been a, um, she was what, about seven grand, seven or eight, I think. Yeah, maybe a little younger than that. Maybe a little younger, but, but the reason that we wanted to, wanted the sound was because it was this beautiful high pitched voice. We, we usually do one show that's exclusively devoted to children. Uh, and uh, in case Grant gets it back, I'll, I'll tell you about a different one that we just had this week. This adorable 10 year old called us from Texas and <clears throat> He said, first of all, I want to greet the, oh, what did he say? The Duchess of Dictionaries and the Sultan of Slang. He was 10 years old, and he was just this adorable little kid who wanted to know about the term loose cannon. Yeah, I just listened, um, to, this. I just listened to it last night. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. All right, what'd yeah. <laughs> what did you think of the little guy? Oh, it was great. <laughs> yeah, he was so cute. I've I've been telling people that if that if I ever have to call in sick, I want him to replace me on the show because he's just this adorable uh, little kid. But he wanted to know about the term loose cannon, which was a great question for us because uh, it's it's this wonderful metaphor from um, the days of warships when you had cannons on ships, actually literally, and uh, you would have to move them back and forth. Uh, during a battle to load them. And if one of them got loose, uh, it, all hell would break loose. It could be very, very dangerous. And that's, that's where we get that metaphor. And it also gave Grant the opportunity to read an absolutely terrifying description from Victor Hugo of uh, what it's actually like when a cannon gets loose on a ship. So th those are some of the, the, meander the ways that we meander to all different kinds of fascinating information. Um, in that case, uh, prompted by an adorable little kid from Texas. All right, I want to try this again. Um, okay. Somebody gave me the advice to share computer sound, but I think I have another way to do this. Can, can I give it another shot, Rudy? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Let's try this again. To, to share and... Hold on a second. Okay. Hi, who's this? Aya. Do you have a question for us, Aya? I wanted to know if high and dry is a good thing or a bad thing. Because um, a week ago we called one of our families and we asked them if they're high and dry because there was a storm coming. Oh, okay. And so you wanted to know if they were safe. I thought it was a bad thing. <coughs> I think it's a bad thing because it's not good to leave something when when you just started it. You leave your partner high and dry. Oh. That is a good life lesson. You nailed it, Aya. It's not good to leave people stranded, is it? <laughs> nope. So, Aya, the thing is that high and dry can mean a couple of different things. It can be a good thing? It can be a good thing if something is safe. Like... Uh, if your friends are high and dry and they're away from the flooding, then they're safe. But if you're a fish, you don't want to be high and dry. Or if you're a boat that's supposed to be in the water, but the storm throws you up on the hill far, far inland. Oh, a mermaid. Right, or, or a mermaid. mermaid. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> no, she doesn't want to be thrown into the land, right? She would be high and dry, and that's not where she belongs. Yeah. So your idea that it's bad is sometimes true, but it's also sometimes good. Thank you. Yeah, so the answer is basically that it depends on the situation. Yeah, you always have to listen to the words around it, the sentences that are being said near high and dry, to really understand what someone means when they say high and dry. Thank you. Good. Thank you for your call. Thank you for talking to us, Aya. Thank you. You're welcome. Call us again sometime. Okay, I love you guys. I love you too. Bye-bye. Oh, <laughs> Wasn't she the sweetest thing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope that was, uh, I hope you guys could understand that. Was it loud enough? Yeah, I heard it fine. 
Yeah. And anyway, she was adorable. Um, we do try to get the kids on. That's one of the things. So one of the things we try to do mm. when we sample the different callers around the country is realize that age is an important part of this, is bringing the younger kids into this understanding that language is interesting. I mean, that's a real fundamental fact that you have to teach people. Language is interesting. It's not, it's not only for professors. It's not only for translators or grammarians or people who write dictionaries, that anyone can have their hand in the game and start to investigate. Um, and the kids have that, those questions. And they, when they come to us with questions, we try to come to them with answers. And, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of places on national radio where you hear children who aren't being condescended to. And we try, not, we try when they're on the air just to treat them like callers. I mean, we're sweet to them and we try to simplify a little bit, but we don't condescend to them. Yeah, one of the things that Grant hasn't mentioned is that he is an expert on slang and new words. And one of the things that I find most fun when we're not in the studio is going out into the schools because, oh, yeah. <laughs> because we learn so much from the kids themselves. Um, he, he'll go into a high school and say, okay, tell me something I don't know. And, and he'll actually have them write down their slang on, on uh, index cards and pass it to the front, and then they discuss it. And uh, Grant, you, it's a wonderful way for you to gather research, and um, some of that ends up on the show as well. That's true. I turned 50 this year, and it is impossible for me to keep up with children's teen slang. I, I can't do it anymore. The, the new language is just zipping past me so fast. But Martha and I did a, an event at a Huntsville High School a couple of years ago. Alabama, and yeah. Al, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, and we collected 600 cards, and I always tell them, don't put down any naughty words, no bad words, no taboo language. And they always do. They always, there's, always, <laughs> <laughs> there's always something obscene on there, some, something, some, some word that they should not be saying. But that's important too. I, I, and we collected a bunch of stuff and a lot of it was nowhere else. And, uh, and then it, it, uh, like bet, bet is a thing that kids say now to mean, it's a shortened form of you bet, meaning okay, or I agree, or yes, sir, or absolutely. And a few a year later, that was in everyone's mouths. But this little school in Alabama showed us that if somebody was out there collecting slang, you could predict with some accuracy what the nation would be saying on a larger scale if you could just be in the schools collecting mm -hmm. language. It's pretty interesting. You know, we'd be, uh, Martha and I are open to taking questions if you all want to have, if you all want to ask questions, maybe on, uh, if, if that's all right, Uri, is, if you guys want to do that? Of course. Yeah. Somebody's got a question or a comment, I know. Yeah. Mm. Well, people are unmuting themselves, so. Yeah. I think David raised his hand over there. Can I ask something? Wow. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Can I ask a question? David, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask because uh, I'm sure you know that in Israel, if you get questions about the norms, you know what is correct and incorrect. In Israel, you have the Academy of Hebrew Language. So you can say this is what the Academy says is right. But in the English, you don't have an Academy. So what do you, what do you uh, base your answers on? You have some, uh, some uh, <laughs> manual or you just use your own uh, intuition? Oh, it's madness. The English language, <laughs> the English language is a mess. It's a morass of differing opinions and conflict. It is, it's a drunken barroom brawl of people arguing about what is right and what is wrong. <laughs> There's... I should say there are some there's some quasi there's some quasi authorities in English, and you probably as translators have some of these books on your shelves. We can turn to style guides. Um, we can turn, but what we typically do is Martha and I have access to a bunch of different books, and we'll look across all of them and see what the consensus is amongst all of these people who are respected and 
can be trusted because there are a lot of people who point themselves as experts who do not come with true expertise and we learn to set those people aside and say no they're just expressing some how should i put this sometimes people claim to be experts and all they're doing is expressing racism or elitism or classism or ageism or sexism or genderism and we learn we learn not to trust those people but there are other people uh, for example brian garner who who's a conservative when it comes to both politics and his language perspective, but we learned to trust him more or less and compare him to maybe more liberal, uh, lowercase l language experts and kind of come up with consensus say most experts to think X or most experts think Y. And in that way, we can offer advice and we try to use very specific language. Like we don't say this is right. What we say is your best choice is. So we leave the door open for you mm. to express your own identity and have your own creative, your own creative input into your own writing. So um, I know a lot of people, the freedom of English to do whatever you like kind of scares them. Mm -hmm. They want an authority to tell them what to do so they feel safe, but English is not necessarily willing to do that for them. So, but you know how it is, even with the academy in Israel for Hebrew, people don't pay attention necessarily, do they? Mm, partly. <laughs> partly. This is seeing a lot of shaking heads. <laughs> like maybe in official documents they, they do. As a rule. No, on the street, the, the Hebrew spoken on the street isn't the Hebrew that's printed in the newspapers, nor the Hebrew that's printed in official government's documents, right? I, I'd like to correct right. you, if I may. Yes. Oh, please. Well, I think that, um, and, and I do come um, to, to language and communication from social sciences and culture. So, you know, you never lose the, 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 the first glasses you wore as mm. you started. They're always there behind. I and love that I, expression. Yeah, well, yeah, we're well, going to borrow that. You're <laughs> welcome to it. <laughs> and, and I think that... <clears throat> Um, well, and many, many colleagues of mine here know that, well, I do argue quite a bit with people because I think that our dear translators uh, go along with the street. And um, I wish I had a, a red pen to mark all the mistakes, the linguistic mistakes I hear um, on the Israeli media or read on the Israeli media because mm -hmm. language editing doesn't exist anymore. It, it has been saved away, but, but well, maybe Uri, we would like to tell, uh, or somebody else who is on agenda and other groups uh, about the wars we are waging there, uh, where, where people um, sort of, um, well, I, I think that, that look, if, if we look at, at grammar as a, uh, as a rule that allows people to behave linguistically or socially uh, in the way we behave on the road so that we don't bump into each other all the time and make mistakes just to guarantee that we, we mean the same thing. Is there any disagreement on that? Or, or would you say that grammar is something that is imposed from above? Um, it is, it is absolutely a consensus between people and not something po imposed from above. The well, exa no, that's, the, that's the point. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'm just trying to, to, to make it a bit shorter, uh, which I don't have, a, I have a tendency to make things a bit longer. <laughs> um, yeah, I do. But, um, but the point is that, um, if we do not stick to a common rule, then we'll misunderstand by definition. And, and the problem is that um, what I see, well, I, I'm, I don't live in Israel. I work also into and from Hebrew. Um, and what I see is that um, if you use a more standardized language, uh, trying to um, stick to um, relatively uh, uh, common rules of um, of language, um, then you are called names. I've had a very bad experience with that. 
uh, by colleagues, ling in your, supposedly linguists. In uh, your work, uh, in your translating work? Um, you mean by editors? Yes. Uh, sometimes when the editors are not qualified editors, yes. And, and, then, and then when you follow, because I, I use my, my anthropologist, sociologist eyes always when I read the, the discussion uh, groups and I follow them, they interest me also socially. Um, mm -hmm. What I see is um, a great tendency where translators don't, um, don't want to, um, to uh, um, take the, the, the role of, of um, those who make language accessible, but not necessarily using the lowest uh, common denominator. And they are going very strongly into, they assume that their readers won't understand, and then they will oversimplify the language down to the, the, the point of slang, um, and well, slang is a very interesting phenomenon, but it's not the common denominator. And yeah, you're, 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 you're talking about this constant negotiation. I mean, there's no, there's never a resolution to this. It's, it's a constant friction. Yeah, well, we started from the Hebrew and, and I say, so you asked, do we? And the answer, no, yeah. we don't. And we have a, well, some people here know that, that I have an allergy to a certain professor uh, that, that uh, advocates the, um, the slaughter of the Hebrew language because he has decided that, that, that modern Hebrew uh, isn't a Semitic language. And uh, um, I think that what he advocates is uh, illiteracy. But, uh, well, well you're, okay. but the thing is, your, your larger themes, not the specifics about this gentleman and, and Hebrew, but your larger themes that you're talking about, these frictions that are going on between the different registers of Hebrew spoken and written and what people want and, capable, and are capable of delivering in different contexts to different audiences, these are the same conflicts that, that, that play out in English and in Spanish and French, which are the three languages that I can read and, and speak uh, after a fashion. But, and we have an academy. Yeah, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and like the French, the French, the French yeah. has an academy as well, and they have the same frictions, exactly the same frictions, um, and I, I, I describe those as <clears throat> necessary frictions, where you have this august body trying to pull off this task that is impossible, and that those those rules that they put into place are sometimes accepted and often ignored, and and at the bottom you have the street or the regular people pushing upward and the top pushing down, and and there's. There's some some agreement in the middle, but there's there's constant friction in the middle, and I don't I don't know that it'll ever be resolved, and nor should it be. And even without this formal body at the top, you would still have those frictions where, like in English, the self-appointed grammarians, these self-appointed experts who've chosen to claim that they know best, um, <laughs> the, they do the they do the work of the academy in English, both in the, the United Kingdom and Canada and Australia and the United States, and so. The frictions are, are there in every language that I, that I know anything about. So I, I don't know. I, again, I think that they're necessary frictions. This is how a language improves itself. This is how, this is how we all improve our own understanding of the language. Well, a language uh, is can I always... put in my two cents? Yes, please. Uh, oh, please. Yes, Hello. hi, Batsheva. <laughs> uh, I'm originally <laughs> from it. I work <laughs> from and into Spanish. I'm originally from a small corner of the world called Montevideo, which is opposite Buenos Aires, and we both speak a slightly different variety of Spanish. And when I was young, we pretty much had an inferiority complex regarding continental Spanish speakers. What is the right Spanish? And I will never forget the words of my Spanish language teacher in seventh grade, one of the refugees from the Spanish Civil War, which so benefited Latin American culture, who said the correct language, the correct Spanish in each country is the Spanish that the cultured people of that country speak, the educated people of that country speak. And well, some more than 50 years later, the Spanish Academy, of, the, the Academy of the Spanish language, which exists for several hundred years in 
was always pretty rigid, except in the way we conjugate verbs in the imperative, which if you've ever heard somebody from Buenos Aires or Montevideo mm -hmm. is different. <clears throat> so much so that it's now incorporated into the dictionary. And a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of being asked that when I translate cell phone interfaces for that market, I should use that conjugation of the verb. So even when there is an academy, change can happen and it can accept what people use. I, I think that you in the United States have basically Webster's Dictionary and everything else. Uh, I think Webster's is very open, will accept most everything. And since I'm not a native speaker of the language, I've put it away and never look at it, lest I make some horrid mistake. But I wanted to ask a question of my own and it is, in this time of um, alternate facts, information, <clears throat> disinformation, which are all perpetrated via language, how do you find this has affected your show? Do you get questions regarding new words, new turns of phrase, new ways of using the language in, in the information wars we're now living through? Uh, yeah, we do get questions. We have we made a decision a number of years ago to stop taking questions about political language because there's no winning on that. We can't, uh, there's no middle ground for us. There's no way to neutrally answer a question about political language without angering somebody. So we just don't do it anymore. I wrote early on in my dictionary career, a dictionary of political slang. And uh, for a while I would do interviews about political language and there was no, there was no victory for me ever. I would always get some abuse from the public and there was no reward in it either. Um, so we don't, we don't do that anymore. But generally, we do see echoes of it in our other questions. For example, when we see questions about um, how to refer to gender neutral um, aunts and uncles, or when we see questions about gender neutral pronouns, or when we, um, uh, I, I posted a link to our social media yesterday about how do you say Black Lives Matter in American Sign Language. So we indirectly touch upon the major themes that are going on in the American culture, but we don't, we don't ever try to break them down. I, I do on my own know something about the work that George, his wife has, um, uh, what I forget her name, I should know her name. She's done more work than he has on some of it. but. Um, on framing in political discourse and this is this informs my own understanding of language um so robin, um, robin lakoff isn't it robin yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, they're not married anymore i don't think but um are they still married i don't know robin lakoff yeah anyway um so anyway so his work his, so framing is something that we think about or at least i think about on the show when we talk about questions and try to make sure that we're framing for example we try not to frame um when we get foreign speakers of english on the show we try not to frame them as um as rare or unusual we are we are brave we frame them as we frame their question is unusual perhaps or we frame the answer is unusual but we don't frame the person is unusual if that makes sense so in this way we 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 do our part on the outer edges of the current waves and debates. We did take a question a number of years ago, though, on whether or not you could have if facts were always true. And we still occasionally see echoes of that come back to us. And it was a real interesting puzzle because it turns out that in a number of different schools across the country, children are talk, taught that a fact is something presented as true whether or not it is true. And other people are taught a fact is always true. And so that's, a interesting, that's an interesting debate. And perhaps that, that reflects more of what's happening in this country where people think if their opinion is strongly held, it is therefore a fact. Yeah, in general, our show tends to be focused um, on a much more joyful approach to language. We find that a lot of times people use their pet peeves about language uh, as a proxy for some other kind of prejudice. And so it used to be when Grant and I first started doing the show that people would call up and their calls would start with, don't you just hate when, don't you just hate when people say this or that? And for example, um, 
we, we still get calls and emails occasionally from people who are basically saying, don't ju you just hate when somebody says that car needs washed or the cat needs let out. And that's just a regional variation that you hear a lot in Indiana and uh, Western Pennsylvania and Ohio. And it's actually a vestige of Scots-Irish, uh, the la those languages, and, um, and it reflects migration patterns. And so we're, we're able to talk about history and how those words really have the footprints of history in them. And I think over the years, Grant, people have come to, if, if they listen to the show uh, year after year, they, they come around on this and they and they start to see that that it's it's actually an opportunity to find out a lot more about language rather than just be irritated by this or that locution it's true well, for one thing we don't want to do an hour-long radio show that's just complaining and for another thing nobody wants to hear an hour-long radio show of people complaining so so that's one reason not to do it but another reason not to do it is you can really move people along the spectrum of understanding if you can just get them beyond that first step of complaining. Just if you can get them right, uh, complaining is how you enter the topic, but you can't stop on complaining. You have to move quickly beyond the being irritated and into the researching stage, the finding out more stage. Who else does this? Where do they live? Why is that kitty so cute? You, just go, <laughs> <laughs> you have to, right? Once they're past that vestibule, the foyer yeah. of, of complaining, so many more opportunities open up for understanding. And this is what sociolinguists do. That's, that's what my wife did for a career. That's what I hang out with sociolinguists. I go to their conferences. Those are the journals I read. Sociolinguists are about why do people as a group do this particular linguistic behavior? And it turns out almost always when somebody has a complaint about language, it's explainable by data, history, migration, there are patterns to it. Very rarely is it just a plain outright mistake. And when it is an outright mistake, sometimes you can say, oh, it's interesting. That's a mistake because, uh, say, for example, it's hard to pronounce that word, so the mouth wants to do the wrong thing. Or, you know, there's a lot of times you can explain mistakes by saying it's a mechanical thing. The mouth has a problem with that. Or you can say, oh, it's a mistake because it sounds too much like this other word. So the mind mixes them up. So that's the other thing. So a lot of times what, what I often say in our Facebook group, and we have a very lively Facebook group that you're welcome to join. I say um, stupidity, is almost ne stupidity is almost never the answer to when you have a language complaint. It's saying that somebody is stupid isn't the reason why a thing is different than your English. So anyway, sorry, that's my little rant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think someone Hello. raised their hand. Um, someone raised their hand and maybe want to ask, ask um, Amanda? Yes, me. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi, Amanda. Hey. How are you? Thank Good. you for your talk, first of all. Uh, I have a, a question. I'm a translator from English to Portuguese. And, <laughs> and I wonder if in English ha there's like this thing that happens in Portuguese all the time that because most of the content on the news in Portuguese comes from English, uh, people who are not like really good translators, they do like word by word sometimes and they invent a new like grammar. So things that doesn't, like they didn't sound really good in Portuguese they are replicated over and over and over again, and they become part of that language. The most recent one is because the test that positive for Corona is everywhere. And someone translated like as test positive, and it's not right at all. We had the way, a good way to say it, but I don't know, people did it so many times that it became part of the language. Now it's not weird anymore to say the like literature translation of like tested positive. Does English is, affect, is English affected by other languages in this case like because of a weird translation you changed your grammar a little bit i, um, I can't change anything so yeah english absolutely is so what you're talking about are called calcs do you know this word this is what we call it in english c-a-l-q-u-e um 
And what it is is when a word is borrowed from language A into language B and translated exactly. So it's not translated um, according to the idea, it's translated word for word. So for example, in parts of this country, and particularly in the American South, where there have been Spanish speakers for hundreds of years, some people don't get out of a car or a truck or a vehicle, they get down from it. Because in Spanish, you use the verb bajar, B-A-H-A-R, which means to get down. So it's a direct translation from Spanish into English. It's exactly what you're talking about. Um, another one is in parts of the country where they used to, or maybe still do speak some French, um, when French, you faire du marché, you, you, you do the marketing, you, you go to the grocery store, you, you, you run your errands. Well, um, the direct, one direct translation into English is to make groceries. So some people in this country, they don't go to the grocery store, they make groceries. So those are just two of the calcs that we've had on this, um, on this website. Um, and even just kind of indirectly related, uh, there have been German and Yiddish calcs in this country. I'll put a link on the, in the chat where German has generated a lot of calcs and <laughs> Yiddish a few too, where big migrations of people came to the country and translated word for word from their native language into mm. English because it was just easier to do. So yeah. I've been, by the way, this whole time I've been putting a few links into the chat for everyone if you haven't seen that. Oh, yeah, right. Did that answer your question, Amanda? Uh, can yeah. I ask a question, please? Yeah, sure. So sure, go ahead. Okay, I'm a translator from uh, Arabic into Hebrew, sometimes from English into Hebrew. Uh, but um, I wonder how you can, how can you evade political sensitive uh, words in your uh, broadcasting or whatever you do, because I've been working all my life in Israel radio as a broadcaster, and I couldn't evade all this uh, problem. Every time I use the word, I got feedback and, and uh, flashbacks from people who were angry at me using this word or another word. And uh, this is uh, one of the most important segment of language, politically sensitive words. Do you wanna take that, Martha? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I had something happen on this, this end. You, you did a, a, a live radio show? No, so yeah. you've worked, you've worked for a, I was a radio reporter and commentator. Ah, mm. uh-huh. Well, you can, um, well, we are, since our show isn't live and it goes through, so Martha and I have control over what we say. It goes through our producer, it goes through an editor, and then the editor, the producer, and Martha listen to it several times before it yeah, goes to air. Sorry, but this is, a this is a technical part of your work. Right. What I mean, what mm -hmm. I mean is how can you not answer, not answer people who wonder about political sensitive oh, words? I oh, I see. Well, unfortunately, because, um, how to phrase this, our, our success has kind of outstripped our resources, meaning we get many thousands more questions than we can answer. So we can't answer all the questions we get anyway. So not answering the political questions is only a small part of the questions we can't answer. So, uh, so we're always picking from a large pool and only getting, answering a few of the questions. Uh, the, the email inbox and social media and the phone calls, it's, it's a giant, giant flood of questions. The, the capacity of people to ask questions about language is infinite. They have, there's no end to the things that they want to know about language. So yeah, it's pretty easy just to move on to something else, move on to the next question. Yeah, plus we're on, the show airs on National Public Radio, which is uh, a government sponsored uh, endeavor. And so, you know, we can't, we can't get too political anyway. Okay. Me? 
Sure. Um, did you call on me? Yeah. I have a question about your interest in getting children involved. And I think it points to something a little deeper. Kids are extremely literal. And many of the questions you get involve the figurative use of language and the ability to discriminate between the figurative and the literal use is really a tremendous step in not only language development, but in child development as such. It often goes along with the child's ability to laugh at himself or to distance himself from his own personal needs. How do you feel that one can promote this or, or actually point out this distinction in any kind of language teaching, whether it's one's own language or a foreign language. How does one make this distinction part of language learning? Are you saying moving from literal to metaphorical? In other words, a loose cannon. Mm -hmm. We have to have the ability to immediately grasp that that is not actually a cannon. Mm -hmm. And that is a huge step in language Absolutely. development. Absolutely. And in learning one's own language and in learning another language. How do you feel that one can best promote the ability to make this distinction and to incorporate it and interweave it into our use of language or our understanding of language? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I, I'm not a parent, Grant is. I'm sure that you had that experience uh, with Guthrie growing up. Uh, we get calls all the time from people who talk about children's misapprehensions of um, mm -hmm. Of, of language. Um, we just got an email from, from somebody who said that uh, when her husband was a boy, he misheard palm of your hand as pond of your hand. And for the longest time, he thought that, that there was, that, that it was called that because it, it could contain water. Um, I think it's a miraculous step. I don't, I don't know about, um, about promoting that except to continue to have conversations uh, with the kids about that. Do you have experience with that yourself? Then? With grandkids, with mm -hmm. definitely with um, pointing out to them that we understand words at both the literal and figurative level and seeing how they absorb that and integrate mm. that into their thought is really fascinating. Oh, I'm sure. And, uh, it's it's a uh, a subject that I think anyone involved in in language has to be aware of that we that we have these two levels upon which we base our expression and understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think it's just just a, a process, right? And 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 um, you need adults around you to have those conversations and, and point those things out. But, uh, mm -hmm. but, but that's something that, that comes up all the time on the show. I'm trying to think of other examples of, of kids who have, have, uh, misunderstood things. I, I know that, that, uh, oh, well, oh, I, oh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> got uh, scraped by a kid, uh, by, by a kitten. Um, we just had a call not too long ago from uh, a teacher who said, she was a preschool teacher, and um, she was talking about the fact that um, there was one little kid in the preschool class who was terrified to go to school, just absolutely terrified and wouldn't go to school. And uh, she finally talked to the parent and found out that um, the teacher had said, we're going to do this, and then in the meantime, we're going to do this. Well, the kid took it literally and thought, there's going to be a mean time, and I don't want to be there for the mean time when the teacher is mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, again, they had to have a conversation about that, but... Um, but uh, I, I think that's one of the glorious things, right, about learning language. And, and if you've got grandchildren of that age, that must be a real joy to well, watch. I don't, I don't remember when I was a kid, a preschool kid. Um, I used to, to try to figure out what, what does school mean? 
Uh, mm. In Hebrew, school is Beit Sefer, which is literally house of a book. And uh. I try to understand how can I go to Beit Sefer, house of a book, and how can I get into it? <laughs> <laughs> That's marvelous. Do you remember how you figured it out? No, I just remember the picture having a big house which looks like a book. <laughs> That's great. Well, don't you find that, that you have that experience also when you're learning a foreign language later in life? You know, you hear, hear these words and you think maybe you know what they mean, but maybe they don't turn out to be what you think they are, or they're, they're just beyond your reach. It's like sort of breaching a brick wall. I think about it, but I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments, opinions? Mm -hmm. There's a hand up there. Um, my question is this. Um, I know as translators rather than as interpreters, we're dealing a lot with the written language. Mm -hmm. um, one, of my, I, one of my difficulties in pretending is the fact that I believe that the English language is very happy using the passive, the verb. Mm. And um, even in written language, and especially in written language, and in, in, in the higher registers, absolutely so. And I find myself constantly in a battle with uh, working meaning, for example, in word, but it, it's always marking anything in the passive as uh, to be rewritten or to be reconsidered or something like that, passive voice. Um, I'm all for the passive voice. It's much less common in the Latin, in the Latin languages, in, in French and in, in Spanish, but they have other ways of doing it. Um, I really believe that English enjoys the passive voice and it's a necessity. But has anybody ever asked you about that? Do you have any takes on that that you'd like to? I, I'm with you. I'm, comple I'm completely with you. And, and your approach is what I've heard from a bunch of grammarians, which is this blanket rule about avoiding the passive voice is not the right approach. Passive has its place. Where passive voice in English goes wrong is when you're using it as a dodge to avoid responsibility. When you're using it as a way to, to, to get out of saying who did a thing, right? Um, some, um, the, the car was wrecked. Well, who wrecked the car, right? Mm -hmm. That's the kind of passive voice that we have a problem with, right? Um, because we need some responsibility there. We need an agent. We need somebody who did the wrecking. Um, but, but passive voice is a valid part of English. If you're stringing along sentence after sentence in the passive voice, then you also have a problem. But certainly to wholesale ban or bar a, a, a perfectly good tense of English, um, that's a mistake. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but Trevor, he wants to, to ask something. Um, well, I have um, one last thing before we go. I wanted to share some words that I've mm -hmm. come across recently. Can I share these with you? Yeah, sure. All right, so these are, these, are, uh, these are slides that I've put together for a presentation that I did recently and I thought you might be interesting. These are kind of interesting uh, words that I've come across that maybe you as translators would find useful in your work or maybe you've come across them and didn't know anything about them, but I'm gonna just share these on the screen and we will see how they, see what you think. Um, So this is a word used in the American South. So instead of a wishbone in a bird, um, do you know that bone that you break and make, do you do that in Israel? Break the wishbone, yeah, yeah. So the pulley bone, because you pull it. <laughs> uh, Procrastinate baking, this is baking instead of doing what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> um, 
what else do we have? We have sad fishing. This is posting social media in order to get attention. <laughs> oh, my life is terrible. Everyone pay attention to me. Uh, fishing for comp or fishing for love on social media, basically fishing for positive attention. Um, go bear. This is to go without insurance. This is jargon from within the insurance industry or the medical industry. I, uh, unfortunately, that's a common occurrence here in the United States where we don't have nationwide insurance. Um, angry pixies. This is used sometimes in the electrical business. Electricity, especially when it's passing through you. <laughs> I like that one a lot, Angry Pixies. That was pretty rare, though. Um, enough rope to shoot yourself in the foot. So this is a mixed metaphor. So there's the metaphor of enough rope to hang yourself, and there's the metaphor of shooting yourself in the foot. And they're both about doing yourself damage, messing up your own situation. Rip cotton to blow a cloud of vape smoke. You ever heard that one? I don't know. Um, plug your plug is the person who sells you your marijuana so here in california marijuana is legal so your your plug is the guy who sells you the good stuff um i'm going to hell with gasoline shorts on i've done something very bad uh that means i'm going i'm going to be caught on fire and oh this is lovely a blanket that you sew where each row signifies the type of weather on the day that you sewed it so you might do colors representing uh, the temperature, like blue for light temperatures and red for uh, hot temperatures. Gunner is a law school tryhard. So a gunner is somebody who is a, studies very hard. They only study, they don't play. They, they do all the assignments quickly. They look for extra credit. They brown nose the teacher. They try to get in good. Uh, Slaphead is me, kind of a bald person. <laughs> um, cookie pouch, oh, that's the, the pouch that hangs down on cats, that when their little belly hangs down, that's the cookie pouch. The cookie pouch. And so in the United States, we have two words for the middle finger going up. So you can flick off or flip off. So put the middle finger up. So yeah, they both exist. And this is called SpongeBob case. Intermixing capitals and lowercase letters to mock someone's opinions. Um, and this is from SpongeBob Square, Square Pace. Uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, the the cartoon show. So it's a way that you mock somebody, and that's that's all my slides. Thank you. <laughs> I just thought you might like to see that. Okay, that was that was great. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. This was very Thank interesting. You very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks Thank for joining us. Thank you very, it was very really, much. It was really delightful. I, I always love hanging around with our people. You all are clearly our people. <laughs> yeah, and we invite you to tune in. Uh, anybody listen to the show by podcast? or? Well, I'm a regular listener for a few years now. Excellent. Oh, excellent. Well, we'd love for you to um, give us a call sometime. Sure. We're always looking for, for, for callers. Mm -hmm. And you make sure to put a link so that we could tune in. Yeah, it's in the chat. Oh. It's in the chat. Oh, and I, I couldn't find answer. my microphone. You expect me oh. to find the chat. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sure, no problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, also on the, it's also on the website that uh, Odi set up. A link to sure. that too would be appreciated. Here's our radio show. Yeah. Otherwise, many things. Most thank you very much. And thank you for your, your intelligent yes. questions and comments. I really appreciate them. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care. Have a good evening. Bye. 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 Bye.